Hello everyone. This is just a short video to talk about something that comes up a lot in my day job, teaching and implementing algorithms for physics-based animation. And that's taking derivatives with respect to matrix quantities. So here's the problem that I want to talk about today. Let's say we have a function f, and f will take as input some vector quantity, x, and it's going to output a scalar quantity. To make things a little bit more complicated, we're going to say that x itself is parameterized by another vector z in a linear fashion. And we'll encode this linear relationship using a matrix capital A. If we want to take the derivatives of f with respect to this new vector z, we arrive at these relationships. The derivative of f with respect to z is equal to the transpose of our matrix A multiplied by the derivative of f with respect to x, and the second derivative of f with respect to z is equal to the transpose of the matrix A times the matrix of second derivatives of f with respect to x times the matrix A itself. And really what I want to go through is where these matrix multiplications are coming from and why they have this particular orientation. So to start, we're going to have to talk a little bit about what matrix notation is really doing. And so the one thing that we often forget is that matrix notation is really a stand-in for writing down operations in terms of their indices. So what do I mean by that? Well, let's say we want to multiply a matrix by a vector. So here I have a vector B. I'm going to multiply it by a matrix A and produce a new vector P. And we can write this down in standard matrix notation. The matrix notation itself is really a short way of writing the following. We can think of this expression as computing each entry in P, here we denote entries in P by the subscript I, by evaluating the summation on the right. So here we sum over all of the columns of our matrix A and multiply them by individual entries in our matrix B. And of course we can write down these kind of matrix slash initial notation relationships for a bunch of common linear algebra operations. So here we have matrix multiplication, and we can write down the per entry formula for this using summation. We can do the same thing, but multiplying the transpose of a matrix with another matrix. And here all that happens is that the order of our indices swap in the initial formula. And finally, we can write down this kind of matrix sandwich, where we sandwich a matrix C between A transpose and A. And this one looks a little bit more complicated, but really we're just combining the two formulas above to come up with the initial formula. And so what we're going to see is that really the way that you figure out the order and the orientation of matrices that arise in matrix calculus derivatives is by having to revert back to these initial formulas. So let's try and answer the original question, which is what's up with all these transposes. Let's set up our problem a little bit more formally. So we're going to have a function f of x. It's going to return a scalar value. Its input is going to be some vector x, which is going to be of size n. And we're going to ascribe this linear relationship between the vectors x and z. And here we've given everything appropriate sizes. And the question becomes, how do we compute the derivative of this function f with respect to this vector z? And you know, we can start out by noting that because f is a scalar function and z is a vector, that this should have the form of a vector which is the same size as the vector z. 
And in order to sort of see how these formulas work, we're going to compute this gradient one term at a time, which is just a way of saying we're going to do all of this in initial rotation. Let's ask ourselves this question. What is the derivative of this function f with respect to a single entry, a single component of the vector z? Well, we can write this out using the chain rule. And here I've just written out the summation explicitly. It goes on and on and on and on and on until we get all the way to the derivative of f with respect to the nth component of x. And remember, once we start adding subscripts to all of these things, they become scalars. So we no longer have to worry about the rules of matrix or vector calculus. We can simply apply the rules of scalar calculus. Just to drive that home, so for instance, this x subscript 2 is really the second component of our vector x, which is a scalar. And we can compress this a little bit by just introducing this summation. We end up with the following formula. And again, what we're seeing here is that I've just swapped a matrix equation for one written in terms of the indices of the matrices and vectors involved. All right, we've made a good start here. And the next step is to figure out how we deal with this derivative of a value of the vector x with respect to a component of the vector z. And here we're going to have to bring back the linear relationship between these two variables. Remember, this was encoded in a matrix multiplication. And we can easily now look up what is the initial formula for matrix multiplication. And now we need to take the derivative of this with respect to a single component of the vector z, which is the ith component of z. So here's our matrix multiplication. Because a is not parameterized by z, we can move this derivative inside the summation. And now the only thing we need to figure out is what is the derivative of one component of z Zm with respect to another component of Z, Zi. And you should be able to convince yourself that this term is going to be 1 if m equals i, and it's going to be 0 if m does not equal i. And this is because if we perturb the ith component of the z vector, the only thing that changes is the ith component of the z vector. It has no relationship to any of the other components. So what does this do? Well, this just picks out one term of this sum, which is a single component of our matrix A. In fact, it's going to pick out the, the component indexed by subscript Ji. And now we can plug this relationship back into our previous formula. And we arrive at something that looks like this. And now our goal is to unravel this expression, this index expression, and re-express it in terms of standard matrix notation. So let's try and do that. Let's rename a couple of terms. So we know that the derivative of f with respect to the vector z is just going to be a vector that's the same length as z. We can call this vector p sub i. And in the same vein, we know that the derivative of f with respect to all of these components of x is going to be some other vector b, and this is just the jth component of b. Now, because everything is just scalars in these equations, we're sort of free to rearrange them as much as we want. Scalar multiplication uh, is commutative. And so we can rewrite this equation like this. And we notice that this is really just a matrix vector product. But it's a matrix vector product with the transpose. And you can see this from the order of the indices i and j applied to our matrix A. Now, if we just reinsert all of our gradient terms, we see that this is equivalent to computing the derivative of f with respect to the vector z by computing the derivative of f with respect to x and multiplying it by a transpose. 
And so this should really give you a sense that in order to work out the appropriate arrangement and orientation of matrices and vectors in these formulas, you really have to go back and look at what's happening at the element level. And that means understanding the initial formulas for which the matrix notation is a shorthand. OK, let's go one step further. What if we want to compute the second derivative of f with respect to the vector z? We can imagine that this is going to be some matrix, which is going to be a k by k matrix. Each dimension is going to have the same length as the vector z. And we're going to play the same game here. We're going to take our derivative again, but now we're going to take the derivative of our previous gradient, and we already have the initial formula for this. And we do the same thing. We take the derivative and we move it inside of the summation. We can do this because, again, a is not a function of z. And let's just remind ourselves that the derivative of f with respect to a component of x is still a function of x, which itself is still a function of z. So we know now that via the chain rule, this is going to expand into a summation. And we can just substitute this summation back into the formula. And so this, is, this gets a little bit messy, but now we can start doing a little bit of rearranging, and we'll start collapsing this back down to the nice matrix shorthand that we all know and love. So here's our original equation, and we know that the derivative of a component of the vector x with respect to a component of the, the vector z is just the value of our matrix A at the appropriate indices. And again, this is all of the same identities that we use to derive the first derivative. And now we're going to use the fact that when we take these partial derivatives of a scalar function, actually the order of partial differentiation doesn't matter. And so we can flip these indices around. And we're going to see why that's important in a second. So we flip these indices around. And now we can rename this structure here as the matrix CJT. And we can tell that this is a matrix because we're indexing into this derivative using two variables. And now rewriting this, we have the following equation. And now it's it really looks like something we've seen before. In fact, if you go all the way back to the beginning of this video, where we establish the relationships between matrix operations and those same operations written using indices, you will recognize that this is really the operation of multiplying the transpose of A by the matrix C by A. So after all of that, we now know that if we have some scalar function f, and f is a function of a vector x, and that vector x is itself a linear function of another vector z, then the following formulas for the first derivative and the second derivative of this function, the gradient and the hessian of this function with respect to z are as follows. And of course, you can play a similar game if you need higher order derivatives. You get more confusing structures involved. But essentially, you can plow through all of this in the same way by first expressing everything in terms of individual components of the formula, taking your derivatives, and then translating back into matrix shorthand. So hopefully, for those of you who have seen some of these formulas, or even used some of these formulas, but never really thought about where they've come from, uh, this will prove um, a helpful discussion. So thanks for watching. And if I ever make any more of these, uh, hopefully I'll see you back.